<laughs> hey, good, good times. <laughs> okay, um, let me spotlight myself for just a moment if I'm not, maybe I already am. Okay. Hi, you guys. Welcome. So glad you're here. Happy Washington Cider Week. I'm Jana with the Northwest Cider Association. Uh, I'm joined here by my wonderful husband, Tim Ensign. Um, we're so excited for cider and cheese. It's such a treat to get to hang out with Nikki. Uh, Nikki Panos is a cheese monger extraordinaire, uh, tipsy monger. She can tell you more about where to find her. Sometimes you'll find her tending cheese bar at the cheese bar here in, in Portland, Oregon. Um, but we're super excited to be working with Washington Cideries today to celebrate Washington Cider Week, which runs through the 20th. So um, we're at the tail end of it here. And we have three fantastic ciders with three fantastic cheeses. I'm gonna stay tuned and um, just chat cider with her as, as she would like. But by all means, uh, let's turn it over to Nikki. She is our fantastic host extraordinaire. Nikki, uh, thank you. Thank you, Jan, I really appreciate it. So yeah, she gave me a really great interview. So my name is Nikki. I am on Instagram and social media, the Tipsy Monger. I am currently a cheesemonger at Cheese Bar. So is everyone here in the class right now in Washington or are some folks in Oregon or wherever? You guys can unmute, unmute yourselves as you as you want to answer. We're in, We're in Seattle. Seattle. Oh, okay, cool. All right, so we got Washington folks, perfect. So if you ever make your way down to Portland, feel free to go to Cheese Bar. We have a really great selection of cheeses there. Previously, um, before I was at Cheese Bar, I also worked at Mission Cheese in San Francisco, and I got my start in cheese in North Carolina at Orman's Cheese Shop in Charlotte. I was a zookeeper, and I had really weird hours and days off, so I thought this would be a fun hobby job, and it turned into kind of like a lifelong passion. So as, as I was working at Cheese um, at Ormond's, I started doing pairing classes there and I worked in a bunch of breweries and cideries and distilleries. And that's where I kind of got my love of doing all things pairings. I did them with a cidery I worked for called Red Clay. And from there, I just kind of kept going. So I find a lot of passion in doing this and I'm really hoping you guys are excited as well. And I know that not everybody got all of the cheeses. And like I was saying earlier, that's okay cheese and pairings and taste is all very subjective and there are a million things that are going to go with each other so i just encourage you guys to be playful and explore that's kind of the beauty of doing pairing classes is that it's it's not about like what's right and wrong and that's one of the things that i've i've talked about this in my last class one of the things that was really intimidating to me when i first got into the cheese world and learning how to taste uh everything was with wine and wine to me is an anomaly. I can taste like black pepper and stone fruit sometimes. <laughs> and then like beyond that, I'm like, yeah, I don't know. So I think that cider and beer is much more accessible and cheese and cider and beer, things that are carbonated actually naturally go together better. All that carbonation in those beverages actually allow for a lot of the fat and the cheese to kind of emulsify and to bring out flavors a lot easier than something that's still like a still wine would do. So has everyone, raise your hand if every, anyone's not been to a tasting class of any kind before, like not experienced this. Okay, that's perfect because that's what we're here for. This is kind of an introductory class and it's just, we're gonna talk about how to taste as we go through and taste things. The first little asterisk I wanna put on this is as we're tasting, don't, eat everything and don't drink everything. Because at the end, I want us all to be able to um, try things with, you know, different things than what I came up with. Um, also, I want to see, I think I lost my chat thing, so I don't want to miss chats. So let me just move something real quick. Okay, perfect. So um, first and foremost, I kind of hit on this a little bit why cheese and cider works. It's not only because of the carbonation because some ciders are still and those also go really well with cheese but um mainly it's all about terroir cider and cheese are kind of grow in the same places so grass and apple trees they both really like wet rainy places right so you think about like um in uh oh my god why am i like osteria and washington vermont 
Normandy, those are all places that are known for growing apples as well as having really lush grass, which obviously we have cows and sheep and goats that like to eat those things. So as such, they kind of co-evolve together. You can think of things like um, in Normandy, there's all those really beautiful Normandy uh, French ciders and those go really well with all of those um, really fun stinky cheeses and places like um, in France, a poisse, if anyone's heard of that really stinky cheese, that goes really well with those really fruity ciders. And um, that's what's kind of fun about all of this is there is terroir involved. Um, what else was I gonna point on there? Okay, so, sorry, I have notes this time, so I was I'm not, not, not so out of the way as far as everything's going. Um, the order we're going to taste in, does everybody have all their stuff out? I know that in the description, perfect. Yeah, I know in the description we had told you guys what kind of to get up, but um, it's important to have all of your cheeses and your ciders out and ready so they can kind of mellow out with the, with the temperature. Cheeses and ciders and other beverages do better at room temperature. When things are too cold, that really breaks or makes it so that you can't taste things. So as the flavors are able to open up and get with the air, you're gonna get a lot more flavor. So I have my three, well, I have a bunch of cheeses here because I tried to get everything that we had recommended. We're gonna first on the cheese side, we're first gonna taste the Beecher's Reserve. Then we're gonna go to all the Cascadia cheeses, the Sleeping Beauty and the Cloud Cap. And then we're going to Apple Farms where we have the Gouda, the Mastamer and their Havarti. So that's what we're gonna do there. And I know we're all really excited to get into it, but I first wanna talk a little bit about how to taste. So tasting is all about more than just your taste buds, right? We have a bunch of senses. We have scent, we have touch, we have our ears. So we have auditory, which is not quite as important in cheese, but it can be important in carbonation and hearing if something's super carbonated as far as the cider is concerned. Um, what else have I missed? Sight is really important too, right? So when we see a cheese or a cider, we're going to get a lot out of it just by looking at it. It's going to give us some cues as to what we might be experiencing. So a soft, like oozy cheese, we're going to expect creamy, milky flavors in general. And then a cheese that's aged and has like these fissures like this reserve does, I'm going to expect a lot of concentration and a lot more flavor for the amount you get because the harder a cheese is, the more concentrated it is. So all of the flavors are concentrated in a smaller bit. So in general, as a guideline, these are going to be more of the powerhouses as far as flavor goes. So the more aged, the more concentrated in general. Sight also can cue you in on what type of milk it is. Today we have all cow's milk cheeses, but um, if you see a cheese that's very ivory colored, that can often be an indicator that you're going to be eating, <clears throat> excuse me, you're going to be eating goat's milk cheese because goats don't process the beta carotene that's in grass like cows do. So they actually never get that in their cheese. So it tends to be a much lighter color, much more ivory. So those are kind of the things that sight does for us. Um, we also, when we look at the cheese, we want to look at the rind. That will give us a lot of indicators as well. So that'll tell us if the rind is natural and something we can eat. It will tell us if it's, obviously, if it's waxed and that's something we don't want to eat. Um, if it's kind of orange colored, that might indicate it's a washed rind cheese, in which case I will expect more brothy and fruity and more pungent notes. So the rind can tell you a lot of things about the cheese. A really bloomy rind, like on camembert and brie, that's going to probably tell you you're going to be experiencing some mushroom notes, some more earth kind of notes. And then um, the apple cheeses we have today, they, they don't process their cheese, but the way they make their cheese, there is no rind. So that'll probably tell you something about the fact that the cheese is going to taste the same throughout. Whereas something like this cloud cap in Sleeping Beauty, the paste, which is the middle of the cheese, is going to taste a lot different than the rind. So a lot of times when you're eating cheese, if you have a natural rinded cheese or a bloomy rinded cheese, you kind of get two cheeses in one, which is kind of fun. And if you don't like the rind, then someone like me will eat your rind, which is awesome. So it's always fun to like eat cheese with people that have different preferences so you guys can all get what you want a little bit. All right, so let's move on to 
touch. So we've looked at the cheese, we've decided, okay, this like, for example, this features, this is gonna be an aged cheese. It looks like it's got a little bit of a yellowness to it. So it might be cow. And since it, got, it has these fissures in it, it's going to be a lot more concentrated. It'll probably have more salt in it because of the concentration as well. Um, mm -hmm. Then when we touch, when, like, when we're doing a tasting with cheese, it's like a sommelier experience. So we're not here to like just gorge on cheese. We're here to experience it. When we're touching cheese, a lot of people are like, oh, I don't want to just like mess with my food, but that's what we're here for. All the cheese judges and competitions, you'll see them like rolling it around like boogers or something. It's kind of gross to watch them do that, but they get like really into it. So when we touch a cheese, if we touch it and it like breaks like that and it causes a lot of fissures, that's another, like I said, indication of age. If it's bouncy, that might indicate to me that it's going to be not as um, pungent. And if it breaks at certain, like, certain crack lines, then I know that that could mean it's a looser curd and that the cheese wasn't pressed quite as much and it has all these air pockets in it. So touch is really important. Um, it can also tell you if it's light or dense. So you can, ex you can expect what to expect with that as far as mouthfeel goes. And then, um, <clears throat> sorry, then we also have smell. So some cheeses are really smelly and some cheeses don't smell like much. This Gouda doesn't have a lot of smell to it because it's a young Gouda. So you can get like right up in there and smell. And there's some basic smell categories that a lot of um, cheesemongers will think about. We'll think about if something's lactic and milky. We'll think about if it's grassy or herbaceous. We also like to think about if it's earthy or mushroomy. That's another really important scent of or smell word in the cheesemonger world. Floral is another one. Some cheeses get really fruity in their flavor in their, or in their aroma. So that's going to kind of help us out too. And then um, obviously taste. So we have our, how many scent, how many taste buds do we have? Is it five? We have sweet, salty, bitter, umami, sour, and acidic. So those are the things that we're going to be thinking about. And a lot of cheeses have a lot of acidity in them, a lot of saltiness, but there is, um, especially in more concentrated Goudas, a much smoother and sweeter note to them. And that is because of the process in which they make the cheese. So when you taste a cheese that's really sweet, then you can know that they have a certain process if you know about, you know, if you, if you read up on these things, Goudas, for instance, they wash their curds every time they um, press them. So they, they put them in the vat, they wash the curds, press, wash again. And that gets rid of a lot of the lactic acid that gives cheese its sourness. So when you see a washed, curd cheese, you can expect it to be sweeter. Okay, I'm sure we're all ready to actually taste. Yes? Okay. So like I said, we're going to be doing, and if anybody has any questions before I move on, I don't want to like, it's hard when it's a Zoom call. Everyone good? Cool. All right. So like I said, we're going to start with our Beecher's Reserve. And since I know a lot of you guys are from Seattle, I'm sure you're even more familiar with this cheese than I am. And we're pairing it today with the uh, Farmstead Thin River. I'll go over the tasting because I'm sure we all want to eat and drink. And then I'm going to invite Jana to talk about Thin River in general. Does that sound good, Jana? OK. So I need to open. I had gotten it ready. One moment, please. where I put my little guy. Okay. Daniel, can you find my wine bottle opener? Sure. Sorry, guys. Give me one minute. All right. So, Stephanie, the rep from Finn River, was so sweet to give me a beautiful tasting glass. And just like with we were talking about with cheese, when we taste our cider, we also really want to use all of our senses again, right? So for instance, this farmstead, when we look at it, we like to see its clarity first and foremost. So you can see in Jana's even better since she's outside, but mine's pretty cloudy, right? And that indicates to me that it's probably an unfiltered cider. And a lot of times when ciders are unfiltered, they have a lot more of a rustic taste to them. 
We're also going to, after we looked at this, we're going to smell our cider, right? So let's all give this a big ol' whiff. And if anyone has any thoughts on what they smell, I really do love participation. So I have some things I can smell, but I wanna see what else. Does anybody have any thoughts that they can either chat or unmute themselves? I also see Mary is from Charlotte. We'll talk later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so Jana, do you want to, if, no, if everyone's too nervous, do you want to say what you think you smell? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. Apples. <laughs> Good call. <laughs> yeah, you know, this is, um, like you said, it's got, it's, there's a little bit of a funky earthy character that I pick up on this cider for sure. And like you said, also the haziness a little bit, um, it looks pretty clear with my backlighting, but yeah. I know the cider, I can see also there's some particulate in this cider that I didn't, I intentionally didn't like rock the bottle so it would come out. So it does look a little clear, but you're absolutely spot on. It's unfiltered. It's got some haze to it. So a little bit of like the yeast particulate is still in suspension in the cider when that happens. 1000%. And as such, when the yeast is, you know, hanging out in suspension, you do get even like some of those bready notes. If you think about like bread or yeast, like right when it's about to be baked, that's kind of the smell I get as well. So. And like Mary and Gabe said, the, the gardening center, right? For sure. Like a little <laughs> earth. <laughs> I love that. So true. <laughs> so true. I love it. It's like that I, I was talking about this with my husband a few days ago. It's like that, that clean dirt. You're like, mm, that good, clean outside dirt that we all love. So now that we've looked and smelled the cider, um, I say we give it a taste because when we're tasting things, I want us to be able to taste everything by itself and together. So let's give the cider itself a little, a little sip and see what we think. And I see Jana, I would have done it too, but I have to talk. She's really swishing it all over her mouth to really get it into every single taste bud. Cause we have receptors that do different things in different parts of our mouths, right? So we're gonna do the same thing with our cheese. We're really gonna get it all over and just let it sit. And whenever you do a taste, you always wanna do your first sip and that's your initial reaction. And then a second one, once your palate kind of like gets out of shock of like, what did I just experience? Then you can really start to mull over what you're truly experiencing. The beauty of the first taste is that's your like reaction. And then your second taste is when your, you know, prefrontal cortex can actually start processing what you're getting. So as far as expectation versus what you experienced, when I looked at this cider and it's unfiltered, my experience with a lot of unfiltered ciders is they're really acidic, very tart, a lot of body though um that's one thing that i meant to hit on was when you see an unfiltered cider i usually expect a bigger body on it i expect it to kind of stick in my mouth a little bit and i would say i experienced those th i experienced that but i will say that this wasn't quite i mean it's very tannic but i didn't ex i didn't expect it to be i expected it to be a little more astringent it has that still beautiful like apple juiciness to it it's not so dry that it's like mouth puckering and at what 6.4 percent i believe it is it's pretty yeah yeah 6.5 yeah it's very crushable so yeah does anybody not like this cider i would think everyone would love it it's a great cider so farmstead beautiful cider we're gonna try it with the cheese real quick and then we'll talk about finn river itself because i know we're all here for cider i mean we're here for cheese too but cider mainly all right, so we're doing the Beecher's Reserve. So this is from Seattle. They have a second location in New York. Um, just like I said before, so we're gonna look at it. Mine has a cat hair on it because my cat Frida loves to be on the counter and I'm sure she found her way up. Um, but when I look at this cheese and I squeeze it, it breaks, it doesn't bounce back, right? So to me, that indicates a cheddaring process, which this cheese does go through a cheddaring process, which, um, is a way that they cut the curds and then press them together. So cheddar cheese isn't a cheese, it's a process. So as the curds break in there, I can see that it has a little bit, a little bit of bounce, but it breaks when I, when I mess with it. So I'm expecting this to be a pretty intense cheese. 
and we're going to smell it as well if we haven't already shoved it in our mouth which is fine do what you want to do um and when i smell it i smell does anybody want to say what they smell before i say what i smell <laughs> you can put it in the chat if you don't sour. Want to. yeah <laughs> if you don't yeah you don't have to <laughs> It's sour. Who said sour? Maddie. Yes, that's great. Yeah, it's totally got that like sourness going on, which to me indicates a high acidity as well. So what I'm going to anticipate is that this is a high acid cheese and a high acid cider, and they're going to be a complementary pairing. Let's try it and see if it tastes as sour and salty as we expect. And then once again, like shove it up the top of your mouth, roll it around. And I don't know if it's because I have these silly earbuds in, but I really heard my cheese that time. I'm going through all these little grains and it's like reverberating in my ear. I can like hear myself going through like the sand that is these, um, these salt crystals, <laughs> which is pretty great. I recommend it. So did everybody feel those like grainy little bits in the cheese? So in cheddars, that is, um, that is salt. In goudas, aged goudas, that's actually a protein that'll create that same texture. So was this, oh, so smooth, I love it. Was this um, as sour and lactic as you expected or did you get some other notes to it as far as flavor was concerned? Was it as you expected in general? Yes, no. <laughs> I like that Mary's like really thinking. Mm -hmm. Pretty integrated and creamy too. Nikki. Yes. Yeah, Jana, it's super creamy. Um, I like that it does melt while it sits in the mouth. And I do get a lot of really good nutty notes to it. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, my expectation for this pairing is that it's going to be complementary as far as the acid is. But I think that there's going to be some contrast as well as far as like, I think that the saltiness of this cheese is going to really elevate the sweetness in the cider. So let's try them together. It doesn't matter which one you do first, but I always like to do like a maybe cider cheese cider and then like inverse it so I can see kind of how like different sides of a conversation or a debate goes, like what's affecting what and trying to like see every time I take a taste, like I like to think in my brain, how's the cheese affecting the cider? And then how is the cider therefore then affecting the cheese? So mm -hmm. it might take a few minutes to think it through, but it's well worth it. Okay, does anybody have any initial? I really want to put this in some mac and cheese. It's very mm. good at mac and cheese. We, I can give you recipes later. It makes the cider taste more like beer for me. I don't know why. Sorry about the dog. It That's tastes okay. more like beer? Yeah, after I have the cheese. What kind of a beer? Like a Pilsner or like IPA? Um, yeah, I guess a Pilsner, because it's more like a, a flat, kind of grainy flavor. Mm. So what I think it's highlighting for you are those yeasty, bready notes in the cider. Mm -hmm. That's cool. I hadn't thought about that. That's amazing, actually, because now that you've said it, one of the beautiful things about trying things is that when other people say what they taste, it's like your mind is opened up. <laughs> I had someone, there was this cheese, it's called Cabra La Mancha, and it's a washed dried goat's milk cheese. And I had never heard this before, but I was eating it and I was like, man, what is that? What does that taste? And another mo way more experienced monger than me said it tastes like peanut skins. And once they said that, I could not not taste it. It was incredible. And so it's like very cool to collaborate with people that you're tasting with because everyone's going to have a different take. I also tried this one cheese and another more experienced monger than me when she was eating it, it was actually glacial blue which is from cascadia creamery when we tried it with a certain cider for portland cider week or oregon cider week she told me it tasted like chicken skin and i could not taste it like all i was tasting was like fried chicken skin and i just wanted to let a kfc after that so 
these things happen. And that's the cool thing about tasting because things affect each other in different ways. Like I was saying, like in Normandy with like a Poisse cheese and things like that, there are cheeses and ciders that are way too extreme by themselves. But once you taste them together, you can handle both of them. So for some people, a Poisse is way too stinky and pungent of a cheese. And um, those like really like, or like the Basque ciders that are like very, very like band-aid-y. You can't drink by themselves. But once you have them with a cider or with a cheese, you're just like, now I can do this. Okay. Did you guys like this pairing? Yeah, perfect. All right, Jana, I would love to hear about Thin River because I was doing my research and I was talking to you about this and I was like, I can't do this justice because I didn't work for Thin River and <laughs> I read up, but I just know that somebody who has the passion and the experience will do much better things than I will. <laughs> You're sweet, Nikki. Nikki, this is fun. I've been learning things all along and I got to taste with you um, last couple months back. So I, it's amazing how much there is to learn. Thank you so much for being so generous with your knowledge. Um, yeah, this is really fun. Uh, this one I'll talk to you specifically. Um, also, Fin River Farm and Cidery is situated up in the Olympic Peninsula of Washington. You guys are familiar with it, right? Have you all had it? Yeah, before maybe some of you? Situated uh, historically on 33 acres, but now an additional 50 acres of farmland. So in Shimicum, Washington, I'm just south of Port Townsend. And so um, all organic orchards and then organic sourcing from other uh, Washington farms. So really a, a fantastic commitment to sustainability. And this particular cider, and, and Fin River makes a number of ciders. And um, as Nikki alluded, I was lucky enough to work with Fin River for many years um, and do run their national sales program. This particular cider came from uh, something really fun called Calling All Apples. And it was around World Apple Day in October. And it was something that started um, as a kind of collection and a celebration of the community fruit. We all know you drive down the road and you see there's apple trees that are just not getting harvested. There's plenty of fruit that goes to waste and doesn't make it um, into cider or definitely into, you know, our culinary applications. And so there was a strong investment, just like there is a strong investment from Finn River to do sustainable work around, you know, looking at this fruit from the region and making something, uh, as Nikki's mentioned, that's terroir driven, that's really specific to the area. And so they started doing um, a campaign and it was calling all apples, bring all your, you know, slightly bizarre, you know, irregular fruit, bring bring what you have off your tree and just yeah. bring it to, you know, these drop off sites. And they started kind of small and did it for a few years and pressed out all those apples. And I mean, there's literally well over a hundred varieties that happen. And now this has been happening for years. And so it's no longer like, hey, everybody pay attention. Like people are like, we're ready. We've got our fruit. <laughs> What's happened too is that actual orchardists along the Olympic Peninsula have dedicated some of their orchard space to growing really specific fruit, sometimes for this purpose. So this particular cider, unlike anything else in the line, is really a collaboration and a taste of the Olympic Peninsula fruit from that harvest, from that season. So you never have the same exact profile. It'll, it'll have a similar nuance if you taste kind of year to year. It'll, it'll still be hazy. It'll still have that barnyard earthy character, um, but it's going to be a different combination of fruit each time. And for many years, it was a, a five, do, five cents on each bottle given back to the food bank. And now it's for um, the, de the donation is going to, um, you know, boys and girls clubs. So it's just always a great wraparound. It's, it's a real good community feel. And it really embodies, I think, the celebration of the harvest season in the region. That's really cool. Have there been any years that it's come in and it's been a very specific profile or do you think that you guys get enough variety that it, you know, like you get variation, but it's generally kind of the same. Yeah. It's, you know, when you do commercial cider making, even if it's smaller scale, you know, often you're striving to keep some consistency in the markets. Not everybody gets to touch that story in the most so intimate way. So you strive to, hit some of the same kind of profiles, you know, you're looking to see that your acids and tannins are, are running, you know, fairly on track. They'll have some variations, but, you know, um, there's also the beauty of getting to, you know, what uh, people might know, but, you know, what always astounds me about cider making is that there's so much pressing and blending, pressing and blending, pressing and blending. So there's a lot of ability to have a lot of stylistic control if you press and then ferment and then blend together. So you kind of get the nuance that you're looking for as opposed to sort of like pressing a whole bunch of fruit and saying we'll see what we get we're not right. sure what it tastes like <laughs> that's 
That's cool. And that's another congruency with cheese that I, I've always been drawn to with working in both of these industries is with cheese, a lot of the times it's all the same ingredients, right? It's milk and rennet and cultures, but it's how you do these things, how you age it, how you handle the curd. Um, and then also the milk itself. They say that 20% of the taste of a cheese is the, is the feed itself. So a lot of these creameries that, um, especially the next one we're going to talk about, they are very dedicated to their animals eating a very specific, almost all grass-fed diet. And all over the world, there are all, are all these great artisan cheesemakers who are so dedicated to this exact thing as the terroir and how they make their, um, their cheese that really affects the flavor. With um, two of them that we're doing today, because it was such a big geographical space that we were talking about, um, trying to get all of you guys together and not knowing where you were going to be able to purchase your cheese. We did have some larger artisan makers, but they still, at both of uh, the Beechers and the Apple, even though they're larger producers and, um, you know, they do make higher volume things, they still source in Washington itself, which is a testament to, especially I think the Pacific Northwest in general and their dedication to really just trying to keep things local. Um, there are some other more small batch cheeses that I can really recommend that I think in the long run would have been even more pinnacle pairings than maybe the ones we have today, but everything here is incredible. So if anybody has any questions about wanting to support smaller makers, then feel free to hit me up after the class for sure. But let's move on. And Jana, that was so helpful because I didn't, I knew that Finn River was incredible, but until I got all of the leaflets from Stephanie and like I did some really deep research. I was like, I knew that they were doing great things, but it's just incredibly impressive. And every time I can support them, I, I, I plan to in the future for sure. That's awesome. They're inspiring. And uh, Nikki, you do have a good question here, which you could choose to address oh, yeah. later, about um, vegetarian rennet. Altering oh the my God. Okay. <laughs> I was actually, so my husband and I have started a, our own little like in our own home mini like talking session podcasting that we're not doing publicly, but we're just like talking to each other. And today we were talking about a cheese and it led to talking about rennet. So for those who don't know what rennet is, it's an enzyme that is created in the calf, uh, the, the stomach of a baby calf. So essentially when a baby cow is born or sheep or goat, what they do is in order to process their mother's milk, they have to pretty much make cheese in their belly. So they use this rennet um, enzyme that will start coagulating the milk and making cheese in their belly so that they can use it in their body for energy. Um, so when we have a rennet that's made from a calf, it is unfortunate, but the calf does have to succumb to getting that. So a lot of folks do like to go for vegetarian rennets because they don't, you know, particularly agree with that process and that's totally fine. As a result, though, we have to find our rennet from other sources as makers. So one of the biggest ones, um, as far as vegetarian rennets is concerned, are from plants. So thistle is the most abundant rennet that is a plant derivative. There are also microbial rennets that have been made in the past, like 50 years, I think, was when they first started making them. And what it does flavor-wise is it tends to make cheeses more bitter. Thistle is a very bitter plant, and as a result, the, the cheeses are going to tend to have a more bitter flavor profile. They're going to kind of pucker you a little bit. They're going to have a little bit of a piquant flavor profile to them. And some makers have overcome this. Um, I've even in the last decade that I've been working in cheese, I've seen makers who have been using a certain rennet actually really improve their cheeses over time. So you will see that flavor discrepancy, but if it's in, you know, if, if you're what's the word? If your ethos doesn't include animal rennet, then that's totally a viable option. You should talk to your cheesemonger. They'll guide you towards whatever vegetarian cheeses there are available at their case. So that's something we get a question about a lot for sure. So that was a really good question. And I think we're ready to go on. All right. So for our second pairing, we're going to do Titan's apricot. So with this pairing today, we were trying to get like a farmstead style cheese, we were trying to get um, a fruited, or not cheese, a farmstead style um, cider, a fruited cider, and then a different variation of cider. So Titan was nice enough to donate um, their apricot to me for this event, and I'm very thankful for them. So let's pour a little bit in our glass. 
And I think, I think this is one that they have year round, a fruited one that they have year round. Okay, I thought so. Um, so they're based in Yakima, Washington. And um, they actually have, I think the largest orchard in Washington, 55 acre. Yeah, so they're, they're pretty badass um, for doing that. So we're gonna pair this one with either Cloud Cap or Sleeping Beauty. Did anybody get both of the cheeses like I did? Was anybody that like obnoxious? Yes, I love it. Okay, so do you guys know which one's which or can you tell on your plate? Okay, so the Cloud Cap has a bloomy rind. When we were talking about rinds, we can talk about this. Um, so it's gonna have a wider rind than the Sleeping Beauty. Also, the Sleeping Beauty, if you can't tell because my lighting sucks, but the Sleeping Beauty is a little more yellow. So when we taste, okay, raise your hand if you've got the cloud cap. Okay, and raise your hand if you got Sleeping Beauty. And raise your hand if you got none of the above. Okay, does anybody want to share what they got instead or what you have? We got a double cream cheese from Holland, and I also supplied Mary and Gabe with their stuff as well. Oh. Um, but it basically, like, I went to our local, like, co-op, which is a pretty small store, because uh -huh. I thought Pike Place was going to have a bunch of cheese, and their cheese and store primarily does international stuff, not local yeah. stuff. Um, and, you know, this one, like, looked very creamy had a couple of holes which like on the website of the the other cheese it's it seemed similar so yeah no that'll be great because fruited ciders go really well with double and triple triple cream cheeses because they they just those lactic cheeses just really want to play friendly with the fruit so i think you guys did great so and you'll have to tell me how it is after you taste them together so as far as these cheeses from Cascadia are concerned, so Cascadia Creamery, great creamery, creamery. they go beyond organic with their milk. Um, they've had their, it's a second generation farm. So they actually, um, they've been having organic cows on their farm for years and years and years. They're in Troutdale, Washington. They're right at the bottom of McAdams, uh, Mount McAdams in Trout Lake. And they actually age their cheeses in lava tubes. So they do some crazy, crazy things. Yeah, they're incredible. And they're really sweet. They're very thoughtful. But let's talk about the flavor and looking at it and tasting, right? Because that's what we're here for. So with the Cloud Cap and the Sleeping Beauty, they're pretty similar. That's why I said they could be either, you know, we could go between the two. Because texturally, when I pinch both of them, I get the same amount of bounce. Um, they have about the same number of eyes in them that's caused by carbon dioxide buildup. And the main difference between these two is the Sleeping Beauty is going to be a little more buttery and their natural rind isn't bloomy like Cloud Cap. So on Cloud Cap, they actually put a bloomy rind on there. So it's going to have a little bit more mushroom if you're eating the Cloud Cap than the Sleeping Beauty. And it's going to be a little more salty. This Cloud Cap's made based on a Carafilly, which is an English cheese, if anyone knows about that one. So as I break it up, it kind of does fissure a little bit like the Beechers, but it not quite as much. It still has a little more elasticity to it. So that indicates to me it's probably a little younger and probably isn't going to be quite as salty as the previous cheese. And then with the cider, for me, it's much more clear than the previous cider. And on the nose, I get, I get the stone fruit. I almost get like a rose hip kind of note to it very floral, very soft, but I also can get the apple. I'm expecting a lighter mouthfeel than the one before, just based off of color and not seeing that yeast suspended like Jana was referring to earlier. So whichever, like I said before, whichever order you guys want to go in. Oh, do you have a question? Yes, Emily. I do have a question. Yeah. Um, so ours smells very strong. It's 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 definitely funky, but we also Ooh. only find it in the only happen to find it in the can, and didn't oh, okay. know that like would have that kind of effect on the flavor. It can because the cans are actually better um, sealers than the bottle. So bottles, even though they are dark colored, they don't necessarily oxygenate, but they don't tend to have the same 
ability to seal for as long. So maybe they've been able to hold the true flavor even a little more and makes it a little more robust. Would you, what do you think, Jana? You know, it's funny, I was gonna bring in, my husband works for Fort George Brewery and they do all, right. all cans. I mean, they do a few bottles, but he's kind of, he's, he's a little bit of a can, can knowledge geek. So what do you think about the flavor? What do you think, Tim? Yeah. Tell us. Well, cans, cans eliminate light. And if you've got a good canning system, then your O2 levels are very low. Uh, bottle caps, there's always a tendency to fail, and they say that the failure rate is three to, to sometimes 10%. Uh, that doesn't mean that you're necessarily gonna get anything that's leaking or it's gonna taste bad or anything like that. It just has the propensity for that to happen. Right. Um, we do bottle some of our like specialty high-end things because you know we don't really think like aging in cans is necessarily always a great idea either because you know there are liners in cans your your whatever's in the can never actually touches aluminum it's touching the liner so keeping things cold and inert is always kind of the best the best plan maybe the flavor's stronger maybe the aromatics might be stronger out of the can that's um, what i'm thinking they, they possibly think? could be i mean you know you shouldn't get off flavors from cans you can always you know you can drink water out of a can and it tastes like yeah water. It, you know it doesn't taste like metallic or shouldn't you know um so yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, it's not a, a, a preferred, you know, it just doesn't have the allure, you know, for our high-end barrel aged stuff, you know, we put that stuff in, you know, cork, you know, in bottles that are usually wax dipped, you know, wax is going to pr provide another seal of, on top of the bottle cap at the same time. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so maybe, maybe with your insight, maybe you guys are getting the true experience and we're getting the gold <laughs> experience over here. <laughs> Because I, I will say I was, when they sent me the, the drinks, this is the first bottle I opened. Um, they gave me samples, too, of, the, of it in the can. And I think that I got even more of the rosehip flavor on the nose when I had it in the can than I did in the bottle. So, Emily, it sounds like that might be what you're experiencing, which is a cool thing to experience in and of itself. Like, these, this is a whole other lesson for us <laughs> today. It so, could be it. So you have a fresher yeah. batch also, you know, so you yeah. know, as things age, fruit flavors and stuff like that do deteriorate, you know, slowly. So you've got a really nice fresh batch. It, it might be definitely more aromatic. Aromatics drop out. Usually that's the first thing to go before flavor profiles usually drop out. That so. makes sense. And like with the pandemic and things not necessarily moving as fast, some of us might get some really old cider. <laughs> we don't well, yeah, know it. Cider doesn't have a shelf life generally like beer. So, I right. mean, you know, you know, we, we drink two year old cider and sometimes that's, that's outstanding. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Or even, you know, five year old cider that's, you know, aged like champagne with the types of yeast that will actually, you know, age and gives it that longevity. So. Yeah. One of my favorite ciders was a cubed cider that we made at my old cidery. So gotta love it. <laughs> okay. So some of us are getting fresher experiences than the others, and that's fine. And that's what this is all about, is us getting all of our own experiences and talking about it. So now that we've looked at it, and m many of us, I myself, have already dipped into it, let's try the cider again real quick, just to see if the expectation is the same as we thought based on the smell. Yeah, I, ate a, I drank a can of this earlier today. And this bottle is way more muted than the can I had before. Even though it's really tart, I don't get the apricot as much in this bottle as I did in the can, which is interesting. Does anybody else have any experience that they want to share as far as tasting this guy by itself? That's okay. You don't have to. All right, let's try it with our cheese. So I'm going to try it with the cloud cap, the Carafilly style cheese. Um, because I think the salt in it's going to really like make this uh, cider pop for me personally. I'm also going to try it with the Sleeping Beauty because I know some of you guys did get the Sleeping Beauty. Mary, do you have any thoughts about it with the Sleeping Beauty? You don't have to. I put you on the not, spot. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. <laughs> 
our dog has been trying all the cheese and he likes them. Oh. <laughs> He's into all of them? I'm so mm-hmm. proud of him. <laughs> dog approved. <laughs> Nikki, I'm, matters. my mind is blown on the cheese, cider, cheese, cider, cheese, cider, like, oh yeah. Oh, it's awesome. It's like very like, should be obvious, but I'm like, that was brilliant. <laughs> I'm going back and forth now, trying which yeah, method Yeah, it's like a tennis match, for sure. Yeah, so good. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's interesting because sometimes one will not help the other, but the other will totally support, you know, the cheese per se, like let's say. Often with cider, I find, I usually see the cheese being a really great support for cider especially if um if a cider has a really herbaceous note i think that the cheese can like pull that back or if it's very astringent a sweeter cheese can really like showcase the apple like we saw in the first one and i kind of think what this one for me for the sleeping beauty personally mary since i called you out for me the sleeping beauty i think personally mutes the floralness of the cider and it really showcases like the fruit and not the floral aspect of it. I'm just gonna keep eating. <laughs> and then for the cheese, let me think. I think that for me, I'm getting a lot more of the buttery notes from the cheese itself. I think that like the sweet cream of the cheese is brought up to the forefront. And I always like to try the rind. So I want to see what the fruit does to this earthy rind because sometimes that makes a very interesting experience. So if anybody's not afraid of the rind of their cheese, I highly recommend you try that too. Mm. Now it's like stepping into an orchard. <laughs> like I just walked and like ate an apple off the ground. <laughs> There's a little bit of dirt in there. Did everybody keep some of their first cheese too, just so you can make sure at the end you taste everything? The dog hasn't eaten it all. Perfect. Perfect. We all have right. some crumbs left. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, Maddie. That's good. Did you guys actually like the uh, double cream that you got? Okay. Yeah, good, it's good. really tasty. And I think it, it had the same effect of like the intense level of creaminess did sort of cut the floral and, and lets you get straight to the fruit of the cider. Yeah. And I bet, especially with that one, with it being softer than this more aged cheese that we have, I bet that the tartness was kind of pulled back a little bit as well on the cider. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Cause this, this is a jammy, like this is a, this is kind of like a Jolly Rancher style cider for sure. So when you get like a, a triple cream or a softer cheese, I really wanted this cheese, this cider actually, if I wasn't limited to Washington cheeses, this is a really good candidate for blue cheese. Actually, a lot of fruity ciders go really well with blue. And um, there's especially this one that I love called Cheriboga that tastes like just pure butter and custard. So if you're not afraid of blues and you talk to a cheesemonger, or if you are a little afraid, you can get one that's a little sweeter ended and not that like gargonzola, like really piquant flavors. And those go really well with these kinds of ciders for sure. Had um, anybody not had Titan cider before? And this was their first experience with it. Everyone had had it? Yeah, they're pretty great. They have some good, um, some really great, uh, I think, seasonal. It's coming out right now. I think they have like a lavender honey. I think that's what their one is that's coming out. And they had a marionberry, and I think they're doing cranberry for fall. So keep an eye out for them. Keep supporting local in that way. And then we can move on to our final pairing because I know we're short on time, and I'm sure everybody has lives that they want to um, get to. Um, no, <laughs> we're like, we're in a pandemic, Nikki. We can talk all night. <laughs> it's fine. Whatever. <laughs> all right. So our final pairing is going to be Seattle basil mint. Did anybody have a hard time getting this guy? Yeah, that's okay. We, I actually, I'd had these for a couple weeks and then I tried to get a final can because I wanted to taste something again to see, to fine tune my pairing. And it turns out that they've kind of like 
not been moving this one right now. Um, and it was just in the last two weeks. So I'm sorry that happened. What did we get in, in like, instead of? Maddie, what did you end up with? The store was this out. Chat, yeah. Oh, ooh, Black Sage. Oh yeah, that's great. That's probably, oh, okay. And then you guys got, okay. You guys got the yonder too? Yeah, yeah. Maddie just got all the stuff. There. Oh, right, right. You guys got them all together. That's amazing. Awesome. So you guys will get that same kind of herbaceous experience. Um, I will say going into this that the basil mint, in my opinion, is does outshine the, the cheese a little bit. So just be on the lookout for that. I think that the cheese is going to be the supporter of the herbaceous cider because this is a big, bold flavor. And um, it'll be the same in the sage uh, blackberry one as well, I believe. So I know that a lot of you guys ended up with the Gouda. Between the three of the apple cheeses, so I'll hold these all up here, really, uh, really professional-like. Um, the Gouda is the most yellow, and that is a result of the cow's milk and then also the process that they make it. The Mastammer is a younger version of Emmentaler, which is a Swiss style cheese. So those are the ones that get those big eyes and they tend to have kind of nutty hazelnut butterscotch notes. And then the final one is the Havarti. The Havarti, if anybody ended up with the Havarti, it actually, in my opinion, it was the last one I thought was gonna work with it, but it worked the best. It's got the creamiest texture and it has kind of like the tangiest note to it. So if you're looking for a cheese cider pairing that's gonna just taste like dinner, then that's this one. The Gouda is going to make it a little more balanced. Um, and the Mastammer, as far as like texturally goes, it does the best for it, but it doesn't necessarily like help or hurt in any way. It's just a supporting role. So with the cheese again, we can smush it. The Gouda is really, in my opinion, especially as it's been sitting out, it's very bouncy. It doesn't tear in the same way that the cheddar did. It's got a very firm, bouncy, elastic texture to it. That's also the result of it being from a bigger creamery. Um, and they use more machines and things like that that add like a certain type of consistency that you don't always see in farmstead cheese. But this is a single um, family farm as well that's been around since the 50s. These guys, um, it's a family second generation creamery and they started by making quark. It's a Dutch family. There was a German immigrant that was like, I want cork. So he started making it. That could have got him into making cheese. And then he actually started making paneer and um, all sorts of good stuff. So their cheeses aren't super aged. They're all very young and mild, um, but they're all very consistent. So let's try. We squished it. We're smelling it. If anybody has the Gouda, does anybody get any like um, big flavors on or big aromas? Oh, you guys, somebody, you guys got Emmental? You guys got, yeah, you're good. You'll enjoy it. Okay, so for the Gouda, when I smell this, I smell a little bit of sweetness, a little bit of nuttiness, and I smell cheese. This, this is like when I smell this, I'm like, this smells like cheese. So because it's soft, I'm expecting a creamy mouthfeel, and I'm expecting it to be a fairly balanced experience. So I'm going to shove it in my mouth. For those of you eating the Gouda, you might notice, unlike the first one, it's not melting in your mouth. It's kind of staying what it is. It's begging to be chewed. It's not begging. You're muted. You're muted. Nikki, you're muted. You're muted. You're muted, girl. Unmute. There you go. You should be unmuted. Oh, maybe your headphones died. <laughs> I can't hear you. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yep. There okay. you are. Okay. My computer was doing that like circle of death, like it wasn't, it was thinking. <laughs> Very scary. Okay. So this tastes like cheese, right? You eat this it and you're like, like, this is cheese. So 
<laughs> the seeds I eat. It like reminds me of my childhood. And then for the cider, as we smell it, for those of you who are who actually got the basil mint, is there anything you smell? Basil. Basil, basil yeah. <laughs> totally. If you think about it, you can smell the mint. I even get like a tarragon kind of a note to it. It just smells like savory dinner, right? And then the clarity makes me think it's also going to be a lighter mouthfeel and very clean. For those of you who have a colorful cider, is it still clear? Is it still filtered? Okay. Yeah, so I think that the nuttiness in the Emmentaler is going to really play with that blackberry for sure. It's going to be kind of a whole Thanksgiving experience. Yeah. <laughs> That's literally what we were just saying. We were like, really? I'm looking forward to Thanksgiving. This reminds me of okay. it. Yes. <laughs> All right. So for those of us that got the Gouda and or any of the other apple cheese, I have to shut the dog up. Higgins, no. Mm -mm. So. So that So in my opinion, the Gouda and the cheese are friends, but they aren't like really exploding one another. I personally really got a lot more out of the Havarti when I tried it. And this is kind of a, an education in how things can not always help but be individual in the mouth. So like tasting is all about exploring. And sometimes when you taste things, they aren't, they don't fight, but they aren't necessarily like doing anything incredible for one another. They're coexisting and you're enjoying them. Um, I think that the nuttiness of the Gouda does kind of tamp down the savory herbaceousness in the cider, um, but I don't think it, it necessarily like elevates it in the same way that I think like the more aged Emmental would, um, just as a function of it being a, a younger cheese. Goudas can be really flavorful, but this is a mild Gouda, so it doesn't have that same oomph, right? Does anybody have any thoughts on that last pairing? Yeah. Nikki, I've got something different. I don't have the mm -hmm. um, base, but I have had it a lot of times, so I can totally get, and I'm, I'm doing a hop cider. Um, oh, yeah. Square mile hopped. So it's yes, a little, oh, I love that one. Just light and herbaceous, but I think you're spot on. I was advising somebody earlier um, on cider pairings, and they were like, what should we pair with? And I was like, well, you can't really mess up cider and cheese too much right like it's no. like it's gonna be good but I love what you said about like it's happy and you're enjoying them but like they're not you know sometimes there's sparks flying and sometimes you're like yeah it's good I'm enjoying it and it's kind of amazing to see how different that those peaks and valleys can be because it's always going to be awesome <laughs> good cider right. cheese, <laughs> the win. but like yeah. really sometimes, like you've guided us through some tastings that you're like whoa the sum of the parts is so much greater a thousand percent. That's oh, that's the whole that's the whole point of this. And um, I know we're over a little on time. Um, but if anybody in the meantime has tried anything, if you've been able to uh, resist and not finish everything, if you guys have tried anything with each other, I would love to hear your thoughts. I really, I will say the Beecher's Reserve, and especially if you ever get their extra reserve Beecher's, the cloth bound cheddar that they do. Um, it's friends with all cider. So I would say if anybody was able to hold off on their beachers and you try it, I don't, I don't think it goes wrong with any of the ciders. That was actually the hardest pairing to choose and like decide what I would actually say it goes with because cheddar is cider's best friend, right? So you never can go wrong with that, especially. Um, I really like it with the apricot. I think it's really yummy. So I wanna hear if anybody's tried anything or if there's any other thoughts that you guys have as a final um, thought or question about how to pair, what these pairings are, what other Washington cheeses you might want to try out, or even international as I eat. Feel free to ask. The first one that we tried, the cheddar, is good with all three of them. Yeah, the Beechers. It's mm -hmm. just an all-around great cheese. 
the um, <clears throat> cheddar is, you know, it was made initially cheddar in cheddar uh, England. And like I said, it's generally a process, but this cheese was made to go with apples. It's just meant for that. That's just like, that's, that's where it hailed from. There's a lot of <clears throat> great orchards in England as well. And it's just, they're all both very snackable. And um, if you ever have the, op have the opportunity to go to a cheese counter that has anything from Neil's Yard Dairy, those are all English style cheddars. They get a lot of that earthiness. Um, a lot of cheddars are what's called cloth bound cheddars and they're larded and then they're wrapped in cloth. And so the inside has this like great lactic nuttiness. And then the outside has this like earthy basement, like what we were saying, like walking into the garden center, which I freaking loved. I love that analogy. I'm gonna use it mm -hmm. if I have permission, but I'm gonna use it. <laughs> yeah, so Mary said the last combo was wild getting scone peppery feels ooh that's that like yeah, i was just getting like this peppery sensation on the tip of my tongue and i was like that's that's weird for cheese yeah and, stuff. and that was with the emmental mm -hmm. that's great yeah that's like how swiss cheese emmental is like the pinnacle of swiss cheese that's where you get those big eyes from the carbon dioxide that like just makes these really cool bubbles in it and as that cheese ages, as a lot of cheeses age, they get sweeter notes, they get more hazelnut and nutty notes, and they kind of can even get pineapple going on. So you guys had a really cool experience, I'm sure, tonight. Does anybody have any other final thoughts before I let y'all go about your business? Nikki, if you look up, you've got another question on um, okay. what keeps milk oh, yeah. cheeses with pear basket cider. And I'll just, I'll quickly just address the, um, I'll just remind us that we're going to, we'll have a recording of this entire session and we'll put it up on the YouTube channel for Northwest Cider. So if you want to go back and do another tasting with us or if people missed it, you can do that. Um, and I'm thinking, Nikki, you'd be willing, I'm sure, to put up a list of the small producers um, of cheese in Washington. We could put that into the Facebook event that we created for this event, if that's, if that I works. I can totally do that. You guys will have that by tomorrow. Nikki's amazing. <laughs> Anything to get people to eat cheese and drink. <laughs> I'm happy. <laughs> For the win. Right? Yeah. So sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off on that question um, about goat sh what goat sheep milk would pair bass with cider. Oh, man. It, okay, so goat and sheep, especially goat, is very, um, very specific, but also, like, especially sheep is easier. But goat, fresh chefs tend to go really well with... Um, I was trying to think about this. I was actually talking about this with my, with my husband earlier. So goat is generally pretty bright and um, also very acidic, very citrusy. So if you have something that's either more full bodied or sweet, it goes really well with that. So just think about like when you have a fresh chev with honey, how that just really just like makes things pop. So if you have a cider that you get it, and this happens to me a lot, especially as like more seasoned cider drinkers, you kind of start to tend to, you know, go away from those sweeter ended ciders. But if you're at an event or you're trying to host people to like introduce them to cider and you know that you need to show them a sweeter ended cider, if that's not your thing, sweeter ended ciders, especially ones with like strawberry notes, go really well with like fresh chev. There's another really beautiful um, cider called Boucheron, which is a French style cider. It has that same bloomy rind that you see on Camembert. And then it ages from the outside in and... <clears throat> That would go really well with like a black cherry cider, I would say. So anything super fruited that can really hold up to a citrus note, I would say is your best bet. Sheep can be um, so many different things. So it, it's all about knowing what type, because like if it's an aged sheep, then it's gonna get those grassy notes to it, a little bit of a sweetness, and therefore it has more structure. So it can stand up to a more tannic and structured cider, much like the farmstead here. Um, sheep's milk, I think, would go really well. Another one that's really great is water buffalo cheeses. That's one of my favorites. Yeah, I know, right? Who knew? <laughs> there is two of my favorite water buffalo cheeses. One's called, called Quadrella, and I'll, I'll put this in the notes too. Quadrella di Buffalo, that one's a washed rind, so that one has those like brothy, fruity notes to it, and it's very bouncy, very creamy. It's kind of the same texture I would say as uh, maybe the cloud cap, um, 
maybe a little creamier even. Um, and then Casa Tica has a bloomy rind, kind of like the a camembert or something like that. So there's a lot of things you can do. Generally, as far as pairings go, think about what the structure of the cider and what the structure of the cheese is. So if you have a cider that's really light, you don't want to overburden it with something really concentrated and heavy in the cheese world and vice versa. So it's all about complementing those textures and those flavors. And then whenever you have something that's too sweet or too salty, you want to kind of offset it with the other. So that's just kind of like, those are like the general rules of pairing. But at the same time, like I said, it's all extremely subjective. So sometimes I'll try something and I'll be like, hell yeah. And then my husband's like, no, I will not eat this with you ever again. So that's just how it goes. And that's kind of the fun. I actually like to see it when he's grossed out by my pairings. So <laughs> <laughs> I think he has a more sensitive palate than me. Nikki, was that the most out there kind of animal cheese you've had made from? Marion gave us such a good mm. question. No. Oh, yeah. Okay, so I would say water buffalo is the most out there, but there are camel cheeses, and um, I've heard there has been horse, but there are certain proteins that some animals don't produce, so cheese can't be made from them at all. So um, mm. I think like there is some sort of reindeer cheese that can be made and that's supposed to have a really intense flavor just like camel cheese is supposed to have a really intense flavor. Mm -hmm. But um, I would say water buffalo is technically the most out there I've had. As far as style, it, water buffalo is actually very mild. Um, there are more cheeses that have almost like made me vomit <laughs> than that. There's uh, the Katsu, I think it's called Katsu Matsu in Italy, there's that cheese that like, it looks like Parmesan and then they let the maggots infiltrate it. And the whole thing, the whole reason it's in Sardina or Sardinia, the whole, the whole experience is to eat it with the live maggots. And so you can either, you can either eat it with the live maggots. You can also kill them by putting them in. This is true. This is what they do. They'll put it in a paper bag and they like let the maggots pop, which is them like jumping because they're like suffocating until all the popping's done and then they eat it and the maggots are creamy and the cheese is creamy and it's supposed to be a thing. And I would totally try it, but I don't think I would mentally enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, cheese is weird. There's also like Mimolette is France's answer to Gouda and it actually is a very common cheese and it has cheese mites on the outside. Um, when it comes to us, one of my jobs as a cheesemonger is to brush the cheese of all the dead cheese mites that died when they, sent them over to America. So that's something that is common. And a lot of people don't actually want to know what cheese is because it's too scary when you think about it <laughs> too closely. But I think it's cool. Yes. All right, any other crazy questions or thoughts? Jana's gonna puke. No, I love it. <laughs> I love a good adventure. I'm a world traveler. I mean, uh, exactly. not <laughs> All right now. Try it out. You're amazing, Nikki. Thank you so much for being such a wealth of knowledge. This oh, has been time. so fun. Thank you. So, yeah, you're, you're so welcome. I, I really enjoyed it. If anybody has any follow-up questions besides the ones that um, I'm going to answer in, in like the email and the Facebook group, please let me know. I'm Tipsy Monger. You can always message me anywhere on Facebook or Instagram, and I'm happy to talk to you guys about cheese. That's my love, so please do. We'll, uh, we'll have to keep asking Nikki back to do more cheese and cider pairing. It's so fantastic. We've learned so much and had so much fun. Nikki, thank you so much. And thank you all for taking time out of your Saturday and tuning in with us and supporting Washington Cider. Um, cheers, right? Yeah. Cheers, cheers. Thank you again. Really thank appreciate you. you.